Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. Welcome to The Long Road. Um, we're going to have a two-spot um, special today. We're going to talk about some of the things that are happening um, around our country today. Then I'm going to have about an 11-minute um, video of the cave dwellers the dw and the Aztec ruins out of southwest United States. But before we get into the nitty-gritty, I need to, as we say, two shout-outs, shout-outs, Shout, shout outs, one to my granddaughter Taylor. On her own initiative, she, Friday, she went and had 10 inches of her um, hair cut off, her really first haircut, because she had saw a special about um, a little girl who didn't have any hair because of cancer. And she said, Mommy, I want to do that. Mommy's crying a little bit because, it was, like I said, it's the first haircut. But Taylor is happy as can be. Not bad for a four-year-old taking the initiative to help someone else out. The other one is my um, grandson, Xavier, little seven-year-old guy, pretty proud. His older brother isn't happy. He um, bagged his first deer this, um, this Sunday, Saturday. He says that he, his grandfather says it's a three-pointer. He says it's a four-pointer because it's got a little nub coming up. But he's a pretty excited and um, so that's why he's going to have um, pheasant and sausage and steak and other stuff during the winter. So none of it's going to go to, to waste. And so, again, congratulations to both you, Taylor and Xavier. <coughs> the, um, when I was growing up as a kid, I used to listen to Paul Harvey all the time. And what I used, really loved about Paul Harvey was... Let's hear the rest of the story, because a lot of times when you hear part of the story, it led you to one, one direction, but when um, Paul Harvey said, let's listen to the rest of the story, it could lead you to a totally different direction. And what I learned from Mr. Harvey is that the most effective way to, to lie is tell you bits and pieces of the truth and let the listener just take it where they so choose which um, is not, it's really being disingenuous and sometimes outright lying. And, um, <clears throat> and so as I was listening and reading and watching, it just really got me kind of um, irritated. A number in the um, union leader, there was um, <clears throat> an article concerning HB 590. There was... Um, editorial in the Keen Sentinel, and there was also um, New Hampshire Voices article in the Keen Sentinel about HB 590. HB 590, for the people who don't know, is was a um, state house creating a commission that would review all federal grants to the um, state of New Hampshire to determine whether we should accept them or not, whether it's constitutional or not, and. I, sp I stood up on the floor and I, I spoke against it. And when it overwhelmingly passed in the House, I went and wrote a, a couple of articles, one that was printed in the Keene Sentinel, other one on the Union Leader, and also appeared on a number of websites. And the reason I had stood up and spoken against it, and it's part of it, and I had stated in the speech on the floor, there is nothing in the United States Constitution which gives the federal government the authority to fund education, airports, fund non-military design interstate highways, provide heat for the poor, feed the poor, improve water and sewer system, provide Medicare, allow an elderly to live the last, life, the last year of their lives with dignity in a nursing home, nor is there anything covering children born with severe disabilities, the mental handicap, and the list goes on and on. And <clears throat> to me, it was just really... Draconian, total um, social Darwinism, um, survival of the fittest. It would be almost kind of like ancient Sparta. Better not be born with di um, birth defects or can't cut the mustard because you were just left on the side of the hill to die. To me, I don't think that's what a compassionate state or a compassionate um, nation is supposed to do. Where people go and some of the people said, well, you know what? Just leave it to local charities. And here's one in the Newsweek, the news, the magazine called The Week. 
compassion should private charities replace big government. And it goes, the right now holds a, a pinch crabby view of government safety net programs like food stamps and Medicare and regards the taxes needed to pay for them as an unfair intrusion on society's winners. So what if cutting government to the bone costs hundreds of thousands of teachers, cops, and firefighters their jobs? So what if 50 million Americans lack health insurance? That's their problem. Well, it's really funny how it's their problem until it becomes our problem. And the part that really got me the hypocrisy of it, there were some of the individuals, and I know at least one sponsor, who um, is going in and telling the state that a lot of these benefits for the disabled, for children with disabilities, and on and on and on, are just not the government's responsibility, and that if they needed any help, go find a church or a local charity. Well, some of the individuals that were taking it were going against it. They had no problem taking uh, money for um, disabled children or whatever. So it was the hypocrisy. In social Taoism, there's not supposed to be any hypocrisy. You're either in or you're out. You either live or you die. That's social Darwinism, pretty harsh. And so it's just not right to go and say, well, the rules are different for me, but the rules for everyone else is survival of the fittest. Another part was you hear over and over again up in Concord, because we, we're really the oldest um, legislator in the country, how people have um, hired lawyers in different ways to hire to hide mom and dad or grandpa and grandma's assets so they don't have to pay for um, the health care. So hide their assets and put them in the county nursing home and let the hardworking taxpayers um, cover up the cost. But, hey, one again, hypocrisy. And um, this one over here said Dan Daniel Foster in the National Review.com. Conservatives have a different view of how compassion works. As Ron Paul told Blitzer at the debate, it's better to encourage people to take responsibility for themselves, and if that fails, our neighbors, our family, our church should step in. Well, that's pretty good. And yes, we have a lot of people we, and families and church and everything, they all step in. A lot of them help their um, fellow um, neighbors. We have a child or we have someone with cancer or whatever, people pinch in to help. But if someone has serious cancer and it costs $300,000, how can the neighbors come up with $300,000? So we go and say, hey, it's not government's responsibility. Your neighbors are not going to help out and you belong to a poor church. So do we as a people say, you know what, you're on your own, what happens happens? That's what 590 is going for. To see how this it goes, to see how this plays out, um, WashingtonPost.com considered the case of Kent Snyder, who was Ron Paul's campaign manager in 2008. Like a close friend, Paul Snyder was deeply and devoted to liberty, but he couldn't get health insurance because he had a pre-existing condition, and he fell serious ill at 49 and died leaving his family with $400,000 in medical bills. It is, quote, it is all well and good to say personal responsibility is the bedrock of liberty, but what, the, but what that really means in practice is denying people like Snyder medical treatment. So that was the part about HB 590. That's why I stood up and spoke against 590 and wrote about 590. But the problem that I... Even worse, with all the stuff that's in 590, the problem I have was the Democratic leadership at the House, no one stepped up to fight um, HB 590. I was not a member of the committee, but I thought it was so egregious that I went up, I, like I said, I wrote the speech and went on the floor. It's the attitude where it's going and saying, well, we can't win, no big deal, we're not going to fight. Well, you could win. We didn't lose. We lost. And then when the governor vetoed it, 
no one fought, stood up again. And so that's the part. Whether it's the Democratic Party, whether it's the newspapers, or whether it's we have 102 Democrats at the um, at the state house, uh, any of them could have stood up and spoke about this. If this was so bad, and it is, we could have had dozens of people going up on the floor. We could have had dozens of people writing letters to the editor and getting on t- radio shows prior to the vote. But no, we basically, again, just capitulated, it rolled, and said, hey, you know what? We can't win. Well, you know what? It's like Wayne Gretzky and uh, Michael Jordan. Cliché says, you can't make any shot you don't take. And we've got to take shots if we hope to, um, to win. And to, to go along with part of that um, the hypocrisy of it all, <clears throat> one of the things I've learned reading today, that it's not illegal for members of Congress to buy stock or make land deals based on information that they attribute to their positions and, profit, and the profits that have been pretty substantial. Just think, if I own a business and I want to make it a public company, I can't tell my friends that I'm going to make it public. Um, or if you're a secretary working <clears throat> in a financial office and you know about it, I guess you have to use professional, personal assistant or professional assistant, you can't tell anybody, you can't buy, because that's called conflict of interest inside trading. But as the article said, both Speaker Boehner and former Speaker Pelosi, they had no problem and they saw nothing wrong with making deals, stock deals that made them a great deal amount of money while they were working on um, passaging, passing some bills, while they knew what was going on in the committee. Um, and what made it worse, looking back, they, they showed that... Um, in 2004, they investigated um, the House of Representatives, and overall, the House of Representatives, were doing their stock dealings, made on an average of 6% more than the average American in the stock market. In 2004, which was even worse, when you compared the Senate, the average senator made over 12%, 12 times, 12% higher returns on his or her um, stock trading than the uh, average American. And so, how do you have trust? How can you have trust with anybody? I'm not talking about Democrat. I'm not talking about Republican. When someone sits down there to make a decision what's supposed to be best for the Americans, and they're saying, wait a minute, how is this going to affect my stock portfolio? Can I buy land next to this new proposed highway? Can I benefit from this? And then then their answer is, well, it's not against the law. It doesn't matter if if it's not against the law. If you're in a position of power and responsibility, if it's not against the law, it's your responsibility to make it against the law. And it's because as leaders, you just can't put yourself in any position where there's a comp, there's even a perception of a conflict of interest. Just think, look how many Americans over the past three, four, five years have lost 30, 40, 50 percent of their 401ks. They don't know how they're going to fund their retirement, if they're even going to get a retirement. And to go and have former Speaker Pelosi or Speaker Boehner says, it's not against the law that I get the benefit of this information. If it's, not, if it's right, then why don't we as the American people give in that same benefit of that information? And so there is, it's really, it's getting worse and worse. It's really a total lack of trust. It's a total um, disconnection because they think we're idiots. They think we're really ignorant you can fill in whatever the, the word you want. They just don't, um, it just doesn't seem like they really care. Or they just think that we're just stupid and we're just going to vote and we're just going to continue to follow behind them as the um, Pied Piper. 
and carrying it on to another one, six members of super committee break away and bid to forge that deal. Well, again, with Paul Harvey looking at the little, the rest of the story, two things. So far, there's over 200 paid lobbyists who have registered and their only responsibility that they're going in is to lobby the super committee. There it is. Before you even come up with an architectural plan, over 200 lobbying organizations are being paid millions and millions of dollars to dis determine how the blueprints are going to be laid out. They're not lobbying. They've learned, let's not lobby after the plan comes out. Let's lobby before the um, plan comes out. So in all, we protect our interests and basically give the American people two false choices, bad or worse. And, but where is the, um, the American people? Who is lobbying for the American people? <clears throat> because I wish I had a chalkboard. Maybe I'll do this in, in the future. We're arguing over $1.2 trillion in cuts over the next, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 years. Yes, $1.2 trillion seems like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But $1.2 trillion, that was nine months of last year's deficit. Okay, we're talking about, we spent more than $1.2 trillion than we had in nine months, and they're arguing over $1.2 trillion over the next 10 years, explaining to us how hard it is, or how it's almost impossible, how it's going to transform the United States, <clears throat> how it's going to save us from going off the edge. And all I can say is, come on, give us a break. Again, we're not that stupid. <clears throat> because we have $15 trillion in debt right now. And if we average $1.5 trillion yearly deficit for the next 15, 10 years, that's another $15 trillion. So what they're arguing about right now is in 2022, do we have $28 trillion in debt or do we have $30 trillion in debt? It isn't about 1.2. It isn't about cutting a little bit here, cutting a little bit there. Because when you look at some of those, <clears throat> some of those cuts they're talking about, they're really funny money cuts. They're saying is if we cut our yearly deficit from $1.8 trillion down to $1.5 trillion, we may save $30 billion in interest payments. So if we count $30 billion in interest payments and put it over the next 10 years, we can say, okay, we've just saved three. 300 to 350 billion dollars. Okay. Try putting food on your table. Try putting heat in your house or gas in your car, quote unquote, on saved interest payments on money that you haven't even earned yet. I don't know how that works, but in, I guess in Congress it works. <clears throat> and so, again, that. They're questioning us. They think we're just going to follow right along. Well, one of the proposals, because it's November 23rd, so basically we're down to eight days. I think by the time, I think it's Wednesday, so the time you, um, if you're watching the show for the first time, they have seven days to get a final, or they're talking drastic $700 million, billion cut, dollars in cut on social services, and $700 billion cut on the um, Department of Defense. Well, $700 billion over the next t 10 years on um, Department of Defense, that is really no big deal. That will have no effect, in my opinion, will have no effect whatsoever on readiness. The, um, <clears throat> the military is drawing down. The Marine Corps had a bump up, I think, about 20,000 uh, Marines for the for the duration of the war. Iran's um, Iraq war is over with, so they're going to start drawing down. The Army is drawing down, the Navy, the Air Force. I think the Air Force and the, um, the Navy have early retirement, or early separation board to 
to get rid of um, more officers as they draw down. So that will have um, major savings. Other parts, um, <clears throat> again, using the funny money, what you do is you project the war in Afghanistan to go out 10 years and then say you ended in 2014 instead of 2012, and then you go and say, we saved $600 million because the war in Afghanistan ended early. Again, a funny money savings to cover um, money that you should never have spent in the first place, um, something that six years from now and that you weren't planning on buying anyway. So to go and say, well, I'm going to buy that nice brand new Cadillac SUV in 2017 that's worth 120000 bucks. But then I go, well, I don't have the money. I can't get a loan, so I'm not going to buy it. So I can say to myself, well, I just saved $120,000. Again, congressional math. But when you read the little fine print, is that um, with time running out before the panel's November 23rd deadline, some of the ideas reportedly before the committee includes mean testing for Social Security on people with adjusted gross incomes over $1 million, ending the Bush tax cut for income over $1 million. Everybody goes, yep, 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 those are good, those are good, we can buy off. And by that time, people have zoned out, and then it comes the kicker. Adjusting the way inflation is calculated to save on Social Security cost of living increases. And then it ends ending many subsidies for energy, chief, chiefly oil and coal. Okay, and also the money for new sustainable energy, which is exhausted anyway. So you look at it, hey, bingo, you're going to means test um, Social Security for people over a million, end the Bush tax cut for people over a million, end the $4 billion coal subs um, oil and coal subsidies, um, do away with um, the money for sustain new sustainable energy, which isn't there anyway. And so, and then some of the money saved on the energy initiatives would go into infrastructure bank and the rest to reduce um, deficit reduction, re the rest to deficit reduction. But now look, look at that. So right there in the middle, and that's how you do it when you market it. Some, you say the good stuff, and then you say the good, better stuff in front and back, and people don't pay attention to it. Well, the last time the Social Security um, cost of living increase was recalculated, was around, I think, around 1995, 1996. And it went a long way in helping um, President Clinton um, reduce the, um, the deficit and allowing him to have um, a budget surplus. <clears throat> really kind of a, a bogus um, budget surplus because they were counting Social Security revenues in, and at that time, Social Security revenues were far exceeding um, Social Security expenditures and so instead of Social Security um, being off, um, offline, and I think Reagan was the one who, who, who did it so he could make him, um, his numbers look better because when he was having his massive um, budget deficits in the $300 billion range, throwing Social Security in looks like, well, it's not too bad. Well, <clears throat> the, the pre in, this year's in last year's President Obama's budget, they projected that the Social Security cost of living increase would have been 0.9%. Well, the actual is 0.3, it's 3.6%. Basically, you can say four times in what was expected, which then would translate into um, tens of billions of dollars extra in expense. A cost, also with that 0.9% inflation cost of living, they projected something like a 3.1, 3.2 um, growth in the economy. Neither one happened. And so we've gone two years without um, a Social Security increase. We'll have one right now. And not being facetious, but there always seems to be a much higher one right before a presidential election. I think the last one before around the presidential election was like 5.6, two years without. And now it goes into um, getting ready right into the presidential cycle, and it bumps up to 3.6. But even when you look at, at 3.6, look at some of the ways. Energy over last year went up 19.3%. Medicine and medical treatment, 2.8. Transportation, 
food 4.5. So as some people have stated, having um, inflation is really under control as long as you don't have to drive, keep warm, or feed yourself. So those are just some of the ways that um, we can um, play with numbers. And what we'll do is we'll go to the... Um, the little video, about 11 minutes. I hope you enjoy it, and we'll come back and we'll talk about some other number games. Thank you. I'm at the Aztec ruins in Aztec, New Mexico. One of these rare national park sites that hardly anybody goes to. Right now, I think there's like six or seven people in the park right now. Verde National Park, looking at Avco dwellings, built sometime, somewhere between 600 and 1200 AD, built on the side of the wall, off a canyon, canyon. Just to give an idea how high the wall is. <clears throat> there you're looking at at least a four story <clears throat> brick or adobe building. Even this is off a, a higher ledge. Give you an idea how deep the canyon is. They say it's about 600 to 650 feet from the bottom of the canyon to these houses. Thank you. 
wave cave dwellings built about 1300 AD. Just really amazing how they do it. It's really amazing that it stood up so long. But there's a lot of us wish we could live in 700 year old houses without maintenance problems. Sometimes you just have to wonder whose bright idea was it to build up here. And if he or she decided to build up here, if they lugged the stones up. Or maybe parents just told the kids they want to eat supper, they get work to do. <clears throat> I was told that the average male was five foot two and the average female was four foot ten. I guess that really makes it back breaking work. When some people talk about a hole in the wall, I don't think they imagine this. This really is a hole in the wall. They took every advantage of this hole. You got level one, and you've got a second level. I wonder who lived on the second level, who lived on the first level. Or maybe this is where the term crap rolls downhill. To give you an idea, how high it is. And you can see there's some rocks up there. Pueblo Indians and other cave dwellers or the ones who built the houses on the cliff was the fact that a lot of these caves had their own water. Sometimes you had rivers and streams above that just seeped through the, the rock and came down. Sometimes you even had streams that were trapped between different layers of rocks. And as it moved over the different layers, <clears throat> it again just seeped. So you get plenty of fresh water, filtered, nature's filtered, and it really tastes good. Is it hot? I'm in another faraway place 
right on the border of Colorado and Utah. These are a different type of Indians, different ones, the Hopis, Navajo, different ones argue over who they are, the descendants of these Indians. It's brutal out here. It's nice and hot as I stand on the rocks. <clears throat> You've got some circular houses. You've got a house that someone just carved out of stone. Take advantage of it. Maybe that's the smart person. Here's the other houses. Just stacked with stone. A little clay uh, mortar to hold them together. is circular, others pretty square, but just really kind of a, another desolate place. Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the um, video. I enjoyed taking it. I know it's a little um, jumpy. I um, put in some background music to you because out in the southwest, it gets quite windy at times, and the wind can really um, bring up a, a ruckus. So that's why I had to cut that out. So <clears throat> we've been hearing a lot about the 99ers, and we are the 99ers. And um, so just the question is, who are the 99ers? And um, that also leaves, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me again. And so, and I had wrote um, an op-ed, and it says, just who are the 99ers? Well, the Wa using the Wall Street Journal statistics, and if, yeah, we are the 99ers, is any household in the United States that earns less than $506,000 a year? Well, that's an awful lot of money, and... I don't mind being a 99er as long as I'm up on the top range of that 99. The U.S. Census recently stated that the medium household income is $43,000. So for someone who's making $505,000 and someone to make $43,000, how do you lump them in a group if I'm making 10, 12, 13 times more than you? If I have $500,000 or half a million dollars, half a million dollars a year in income, there's a good chance that um, in my, I can probably earn more on my investments than more than half the households in the United States on a yearly. You know, basically, if I have half a million dollars, after three or four years, I could very easily have a, a million dollar portfolio. And basically, it doesn't, 5% gives me $50,000. And 5% is not that hard to, to get. So, really, <clears throat> to me, the 99ers is not the American middle class. And when I went looking, if I just said, you know what, let's see what the real middle is. We divide it into, into four. And so, the first one to 25, make that the, the lower uh, or the working poor. <clears throat> or then the, the top 25%. Well, if you look at the top from 26 to 74, which I call the real middle, middle class, that's households earning from $21,000 to $84,000. $21,000, depending where you live, $21,000, a family um, of four, you're at, you're at a below poverty level. Again, and... <clears throat> 84000 depending where you live, that could be um, a good income. Other places may not be an income at all. You could be living in New York, or New York, $84,000 isn't going to cover you much. Um, Boston, it's not going to cover you much. And so, again, I think you, if you're going to find out who the real 99ers is, I think it should be the 70, 26 to 74. Those are the real middle class the people at $21,000 to $84,000 a year struggling just to, to get by. And so that's the, 
And when you look at $21,000, that is $10 an hour. $84,000 could be a lot of, looks like a lot of money, but if I'm working by myself and my wife and my kids are coming home, $84,000 is a pretty good job. But a, a lot of households, if you're making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars, $80,000, that's because two people in the household are working. And in some cases, the 84000 is mom, dad, and their teenagers are working to get up to that 84000 So it's, again, you have to look inside the, those numbers. And um, the other part is, yeah, mom and dad... <clears throat> Can both be working. Mom and dad can both be making forty thousand dollars a year, earning about twenty dollars an hour, <clears throat> and that's not really much if you're a college, both have college degrees and you you're paying off your college loan. But hopefully by this time your loans are, are paid off. But again, that's a, that's a faulty number because if mom has to buy a car and pay four hundred dollars a month for <clears throat> the the car, say taxes, insurance, um, gas, and paying $400. So all of a sudden, that's $5,000 $5, out of the year is gone. If you have to pay three, dollars $400 a month for um, child care, which would be really cheap, there's another five, dollars $600 off. And so really, for all of a sudden, if I'm making $84,000 and my wife's at home, that's a real $84,000. Two people could be working. And because of the costs addressed associated with working, extra vehicle, child care, the whole thing, their eighty four thousand could very easily lose fifteen, twenty thousand dollars just so basically one person can be working forty earning forty thousand dollars a year just to bring in twenty thousand into the household. And so to me I think we really need to look at who is the um the real middle class. And for example, I went through New Hampshire's um, <clears throat> Department of Revenue um, statistics. And they're all over the place because what they do is they bounce numbers off to, depends on who, which political party is in control, which, um, what can I best use to get the numbers to keep my boss happy? It would be nice to say that all our um, commissioners and everything are totally independent, but you know what? We really don't want totally independent people. We don't want people to um, tell us what we need to hear. We want people that are going to ask us what we want to hear, and then they'll tell us what we want to hear. And sometimes they'll even go overboard to really convince us what we want to hear is really as good as we think it is. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, one of the big things that they've been talking about, um, right to work and how it will benefit the, um, the government, the, um, the towns and businesses that come in, broaden the tax base. They also talk about um, how overpaid local government workers are and um, state workers. Well, but here's again, if you look inside the numbers, the, um, <clears throat> the average wage um, in 2009, weekly wage in 2009 was $867 a week. So that comes out to about 42, I mean, about, 20, about $22, 22 to $23 per hour. Well, when you went to local government, Workers like Keene, Winchester, Swansea, the average salary for a local government worker is $720. And so, yes, we have um, some government workers that are getting paid um, pretty good um, wage. But when you look at the local government worker, the individual that um, sweeps up the leaves, um, cleans out the sewers, works at the water treat waste treatment plant, plows your snow... Their average is about $720 a week, about $37,000 a year. And so not very much. Um, when we go to state workers, the average state worker gets $849 um, a week, <clears throat> still lower than the average private sector wages 
in um, New Hampshire. And so it is really easy to go and say, let's privatize um, certain jobs, that way we can save money. In some cases, yeah, privatization is the, the way to go. Other places, no. And just to go off the cuff and say, well, if we privatize these jobs, we'll automatically save money. Well, I don't think so. You're going to have to pick and choose. <clears throat> Where the numbers <clears throat> they um, tend to use, but they don't put the adjective in, the, um, the federal government. In the state of New Hampshire, the average federal government worker earns $1,295 per week almost about 80% higher than the, the local worker and um, about 35% higher than the state worker. So the average federal worker in the state of New Hampshire may, earns almost $68,000 <clears> a year. And so if you're going to go after the workers, if you're going to say right to work, or you're going to go and go after the, um, the unions, I think you just have to be, be really careful and concerned because this ain't apples and oranges. This is apple and zucchini. That's so far apart because you, you're not going to have any effect whatsoever on federal workers' salaries. And you're not going to go and reduce um, local government salaries much lower than, for example, like I said, $720 a week. Basically, you may end up getting less people interested in, um, to, in, in working. Again, so when you go inside the, the numbers again in New Hampshire, um, personal income in New Hampshire was $56.4 billion, <clears throat> a 2.1% decrease from 2008. And that's the first drop, yearly drop, since 1938. And... <clears throat> People go, well, that's because people don't have jobs or people are working less. And yes, that's a pretty um, astute observation. Um, yeah, people are working less. There's people who want to work. Um, <clears throat> but if we go back to what we earlier in HB um, 590 and um, Ron Paul's um, Leave It to Charity and um, <clears throat> the local churches, and not just picking on Ron Paul, which that was one of his platforms, but there's a lot of people that, that believe that. And, it, and, and they're not all libertarians, there's something not all Republicans, they're, they're all over. In the um, state of New Hampshire, <clears throat> $8.3 billion in 2009, $8.3 billion, <clears throat> that's um, how much are transfer payments, the Social Security, family assistance that the um, people in New Hampshire depend on. So basically, about 12% of all the income in um, New Hampshire is as a result of government transfer payments. So... Yes, if you can take basically eight to nine million billion dollars out of the New Hampshire economy and say, find a way to make it up. And if these people are not spending money, there's no way in the world that the number of people being employed will be able to stay employed. And so it then becomes a vicious circle. And so there's a question, how do you do it? Yes, without, without doubt, there's people whether it's the VA disability or the Social Security or disability, there are people cheating the system. Yes, there's people on Medicare cheating the system. And people on Medicaid cheating the system. But you can't whitewash and say everybody is cheating the system or the system is broke. No, we know that our people are cheating the system. It's our responsibility to go out and take care and punish the people who are cheating the system. Because not only are they cheating the system, they're cheating the people who really need help, but they're also cheating the people who are putting their hard-earned tax dollars to help their, their fellow citizens. And also in 2009, there was a 20, over a greater than 20% increase in supplement um, nutrition assistance 
meals and, and uh, meals at schools and stuff because a lot of kids, the only meals they're getting, quality meals, is breakfast and lunch in school, family assistance, Social Security supplemental income. So <clears throat> things are, are really, <clears throat> really getting worse. And um, I don't see how they're going to get, in the, um, get better in the near future. And so when we look at salaries in New Hampshire, if you're a utilities worker, you average uh, about almost $1,700 um, a week. Yeah, you work overtime. Manager, management of a company management is average about almost 1500 Finance and insurance, about 1400 <clears throat> And construction, about 950 So in that group, utility workers, if they average, that's $87,000. So a utility worker in the state of New Hampshire, like an electric guy, or woman, they'd be in the top 25% of all wage earners in the United States. <clears throat> now let's go to the bottom of the list. <clears throat> Retail workers, $506 a week, or they average $26,000 a year. Hotel and food service employees, $324 a week, or $17,000 a year. Truck drivers, warehouse workers, $686 for about $36,000 a year. Now, if you look at the, um, <clears throat> the, the report, the report says, yeah, but these people don't work full time. They usually work 25 to 30 hours a week. So that's why their um, salaries are so low. Well, yeah, but if you flip the coin, the reason they work 25 to 30 hours a week is so they don't get any benefits. And <clears throat> benefits, what are benefits? So those are little um, thingamajigs. So that's how they, um, they can trick you with numbers. Um, a real quick one, as I know we're running out of time. Again, the tax rate. Everybody in the tax rate. In 2009, Department of Revenue um, comparison, there's 220 tax rate places. Berlin was um, 220. And at the total, total real tax rate, um, fair value, its fair, full value tax rate was 4110. 19th, 219th, second from last was Winchester at 3004, Pittsburgh at 2996, Keene, 2967, and Allentown, 2921, and Claremont, 2825. And <clears throat> The numbers are a little bit changed. There's a difference between um, full value and what we actually pay. Um, Keene paid $28.80, but their real full value was $29.67. We don't have them all right now, but Keene is about number two before we'll find out where the final one's in about three weeks. But if you go down to um, New Hampshire community by household income, <clears throat> Keene is 205th place. Um, 30, um, basically 19 from the bottom, 29 from the bottom at $37,000 per household. Again, the numbers are, are all over the place. The numbers are not looking as good as a, we like to think there are. And so time is running out. And um, like I said, maybe next time I'll get a chalkboard and make some of these things easy to do. But the best piece of advice that that I can give anybody and the advice I follow and the advice I um, try to teach my children and teach my grandkids, ask, ask, ask. It's your responsibility to ask. If you don't ask, people are going to tell you what they want you to hear. And the more you listen to what other people tell you what you want to hear, the farther and farther away you're going to get away from knowing what the truth is. Any time, especially in the presidential election, it's coming. Every single one of these people, I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican, I don't care if they're a staffer or whatever, I don't care if it's a newspaper or radio, ask the question. Do not be afraid to ask the question. If you're shaking, your knees are shaking and your gut's rumbling, you know you're getting ready to ask the right question. Stand up, ask the right question. You need to ask that question. That's the only way you're going to get the answers for you to make the decision. 
you need to be able to make the informed decision and not have someone else make the decision for you. So enough rambling for now. And so thank you. And I'll see you out there on the long road. And if you see me, don't be afraid to ask me anything.